Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and welcome to another comic art demonstration. In this video, we are going to be talking about the process that I went through to create a character for Rob Arnold's comic book series Replicator. Now this character is one heck of a big beastie. He is by no means of average human proportions. He is what you might refer to as a brute. So his anatomy and the general structure of his body, we're going to approach it in a different way this time around. It's not going to be how you would go about drawing a typical normally sized human being. Everything is going to be much, much bigger. So you can see here, even in the preliminary stages of the drawing, that the forms I'm placing down into the structure that will ultimately hold up the rest of his body, all the anatomy that we place in on top, his design, you can see that it's bulging, that its shape is accentuated, that every single part of his body here has been exaggerated to the max. I'm stylizing it also a little bit more than I normally would as well. And the reason for that is because his muscles and the general anatomy that we're going for here is over the top. It's supposed to be. We want him to come across in that way. He is, in all sense of the word, a monster, an absolute creature of a character. And when he comes up against anyone else, any other character within the story, he will be towering over the top of them. He's a giant. An average person would probably come up to about his peck there, his chest, just underneath it maybe. So he is a very, very large character, and I really want that to come across in the way in which I'm shaping his anatomy and getting it in there. And a lot of this is all about capturing the right kind of shape. And you can see here that as I lay down the structure, the fundamental basis of his body, that I'm already starting to sketch in the major muscle groups that will be present throughout his body, the muscles of his arms, the muscles of his torso, and then in a moment, his legs. And I'm trying to get those in there and established just to make sure that as I'm working on this brutish creature of a character, that his anatomy is going to fit together and work correctly. Because when you are doing an extreme character such as this, where the anatomy is blown out of proportion, it can be easy to go a little bit too over the top, to go up the other end of the scale way too far to the point where it's just not a functional design. In other words, the character wouldn't be able to move correctly. Now on a technical level, we're working in Manga Studio here. This is also known as Clip Studio Paint. I'm using the darker pencil brush, it, using the pencil tool here as we sketch the basic roughs down for the character. And again, I'm, th I'm not thinking in any level of detail here. I'm really trying to interpret the character that I'm drawing in terms of big bold shapes, major forms that the overall structure will consist of. And once I get those down over the top of those major shapes, I've got a nice base there to start drawing in the anatomy, just loosely sketching it in there and trying to get everything sized up and proportioned correctly. Because even though this guy doesn't really fit into the traditional set of proportions you'd see on an idealized human figure. He still does need to appear proportionate in and of himself within his own structure. He has to look as though he makes sense visually. Because when you've got a way out there character like this, you can get away with a lot 
because he's an abnormal character, right? So a viewer might look at him and understand him and just take the character for what it is because they don't really have a set understanding or model of how this character should look already because you're just making it up. It's so out there that they don't yet have a preconceived understanding of how it should look. So it can kind of look like anything. However, there is a certain point where you can break the suspense of believability or the suspense of disbelievability, rather, where the viewer looks at the character and it's just out there enough that it, it breaks that that understanding of reality that they do have. And it does so to the point where all of a sudden the viewer's looking at it and they're, they're really starting to think, hey, this isn't making sense. The character can look however you want it to look, but it does need to make sense. It needs to look as though it could work in some way. Because if it's just completely randomly slapped together and it doesn't make any sense on a mechanical level, it's not functional, then that's when the audience will start to look at your concept, at your design, and they'll begin to observe it in a much more critical way. They won't just take it for what it is anymore. They'll start to judge it, and if they start to analyze it too closely and your character isn't really measuring up and passing that analysis in a satisfactory manner, and by the way, this all happens unconsciously on the audience's behalf then what's going to happen is they're going to dismiss your design. They will put it in the, hey, this doesn't look right, this isn't working category, and they will tend not to find what you're showing them appealing. They will not like the look of the design because of that. So now what I've done is I've moved on to some smaller diagrams of this character so that not only can we get a good look at what his design will look like from the front three quarter view but also what it's going to appear as from the back and this is really important especially when it comes to creating concept designs for comic books for video games or for movies because what you end up with is a design which will ultimately not be static. It's not going to be viewed from only one angle like you would in illustration. Instead, it will be in motion. It will translate over to a sequence where that character could be viewed from any number of angles. And so in the pre-production phase of any project, a comic book, a movie, or a video game, as I was saying, the concept designs that you're creating for those productions need to be fully fleshed out from every possible angle so that the actual production designers who are going to be making the three-dimensional models or illustrating that comic book or creating the costuming for that movie know without a doubt exactly how that character is to look from every conceivable angle. So our job as concept designers, and you know, this might not be necessarily your set career position. You may not want to be a concept artist exclusively. This may be a concept design for your own comic book or your own movie or your own video game. A lot of the time, we as artists are going to be multifaceted within our skill set, which means we're going to have a broad range of abilities to execute creatively. In other words, we may, we, like for me, for example, I'm a fairly competent concept artist. I'm pretty good at 3D modeling and 3D sculpting. And I'm an okay animator as well. 
at least in a 3D sense and probably in a drawing sense as well if I had the amount of time I'd need to actually complete a hand-drawn animation. Now that's not something that I'm super interested in. I really love design and I really love comic book art. But as I was saying, when you have developed your ability to be able to illustrate a character from any angle that you want, and you understand the principles of anatomy, you understand the principles of proportion and the human figure, the way in which it moves, then that gives you an underpinning knowledge that, in theory, should allow you to be able to sculpt a 3D model of that character once you've drawn it, or to realize it in some other medium, because anatomy in one medium is anatomy in another. So it doesn't really matter as long as you've got that knowledge there. In fact, if you are an artist and you have been honing your craft for an extended period of time over the years, you'll probably find that if you were to jump over into 3D modeling that you'd be fairly good at it. Now as far as the backstory is concerned for Goliath here, which is the name of the character, I'm not quite sure in detail what that's supposed to be B. All I know is that he is an experiment that went successfully. So you can see that he is an overgrown mutant of some kind. I've got the human scale set up next to him just so you've got a visual indication as to what his scale actually is. And a lot of the time when it does come to designing character concepts, it's good to have that scale there or some something that you can compare, can compare to, something that you're very familiar with in terms of its size, that you can create a comparison with for the character that you're actually showing to the viewer. That, that, that way they've, they can look at the scale of that object or that thing or that figure and they can compare it to the actual concept that you're creating and they can see the size differences. Now you'll notice here that I wasn't really happy with the positioning of Goliath's legs. And so I completely erased them and I re-sketched them in there. And it's important when you see an opportunity to improve upon the illustration that you're creating to take that, even as if it does mean completely erasing half of that character's body. Especially at this stage, before we've taken the time to lay in the final contours and polish up the line work, before we've started to render out the forms and add in those additional intricacies. This initial foundational stage is the point where you really want to make sure that you've established that character's pose, their positioning, their proportions, and their anatomy because if you get that wrong and it's not sitting right and you start to add in all that detail in on top it'll be added in within the context of that flawed foundation and so you can add in as much detail as you want on top of a flawed foundation but it's still going to be a drawing which was constructed wrongly and when you've invested that much time into it, and we will be investing a lot of time into Goliath's concept here, you really want to make sure that you're not wasting your time, that you have got that foundation 100% solid before you take it further onto the next step. And the process here really is just getting down that basic structure and laying in the major muscle groups throughout his body, making sure that they're all fitting together in the right way. I often like to think of muscle groups as kind of like puzzle pieces that fit around the major form of the character's structure. And it's just about making sure that they sit snugly in place in the correct areas. There is a lot of puzzle pieces to fit around the human body, right? The muscle structure of the human figure is quite complex. There's a lot to consider. But if you break it down into sections and you think 
of the human body in terms of its major parts, you know, the torso, the legs and the arms, and you focus on each one of those areas individually. And then you work out how the major muscle groups fit around those particular sections. You take the time to study them up. You make sure that you're consistent with your practice to the point where at some time, once you've practiced them enough, you've memorized exactly where those muscles need to go, which muscles sit next to one another, and how large they need to be proportionally, because muscles have proportions as well. It's not just the entire structure of the human body from head to toe. It is also the individual muscles within it that have their own scale and must be scaled accordingly also for that character to look as though they have been structured correctly. Once you've memorized all that, it's not all that hard because you start to draw out an arm for that character and all of a sudden, the muscle groups within that area of the body are recalled and it's almost as if as you lay in one major muscle group after the other, that they remind you of the other muscle groups which are to surround them. And so you go ahead and you lay those in, and then they, by association, remind you of the other muscle groups that come there on after. And so it really is quite interesting the way in which, through practice, we recall the, the repetition that we've gone through to really hone our skills in the areas of figure drawing and anatomy. And it's something that, as an artist who is only just starting out, you can keep in mind and know that with enough practice, even though this may appear overwhelming, that there is a lot to consider, you will at some point be able to recall all of this and that it is possible. The human mind is very capable of recalling extremely complex information to the point where you are able to remember every single muscle throughout the human body, at least the ones that matter. You don't, you know, th there's layers of muscle throughout the human body. Not all of them are visible. You do not need to be a surgeon here. And in fact, you're not going to even be articulating every single muscle to that degree when it comes to your comic art. It's kind of stylized in a way. You will be grouping them together, at least the, the smaller intricate muscles, and you will be only really showing at the end of the day the major ones. The ones that really define the shape of the human body, the outside contours which matter the most. All right, so now that our basic sketch is down, I have created another layer on top of it. So you can see over to the right hand side of the screen there in the layers panel, I've got my pencils layer, which I've converted to blue using the color layer function in Manga Studio. That's the little blue square in the panel above the layers panel called layer properties. And then what I've done is I've created another layer on top of it. And on this layer, this is where we are going to start sketching out Goliath's design. So we know roughly what kind of body type he is going to have. We've, we've figured that out. Now it's just a matter of going in on top of that and starting to knock out the secondary details using what we've already laid down onto the page and now building on top of it. So this is a sculpting process. And you can think of it as if we have already knocked out the basic structure of our, our clay model here of Goliath. And now we're going in and we're starting to sculpt out those smaller, more intricate components that will make up the visuals of how he's going to look within the comic book. Because he is for a comic book, he's for Rob Arnold's replicator, so, you know, 
I've got to make sure that I know exactly how this guy is going to appear in the book. And I've got to do so in a way as I design him. I've got to make sure that he's going to look good within that medium. Now, there are a few details here that Rob wanted me to include within Goliath's design. For example, the mini guns, the chain guns on either arm. He also wanted me to include a metal chest piece on one of his pecs. And he had given me some references to help me figure out how his headgear would look. You can see that there is some metal mechanical components around his jaw there and around the front of his face. He is wearing almost like this, this metal mask. And it really does make him look extremely terrifying as a comic book character. All right, so... Other than that, other than those artificial components that we're going to see pop up throughout his body here, a lot of it is just his muscle structure and defining that. Now, what you'll see me do here is I'm going ahead around the abdominal region as we work our way down his massive structure. I'm going ahead and I'm outlining where the shadows are going to cluster underneath his chest as he bends over, as he arches over and looms forward. So you're going to see shadows gather there if the major light source is indeed coming from the top left of this composition, which is, it is indeed, that's what I've decided here. You decide where the light sources will reside throughout your comic book illustrations. You just need to know where they are and make sure that the shadows you place into your artwork are consistent with it. Use it as a guide. Mark it if you need to. Actually place a little indication, maybe a dot or something, that, or an arrow I will usually use, which shows you the direction that the light source is projecting light down onto the character from. So you can see here that I'm giving him some mechanical undies of some kind, just to, you know, cover him up a little bit. And I'm trying to make it fit in with a similar visual architecture that I've already defined for the facial mechanical components that I've added in around his head, and also along with the metal chest piece that I've attached to his pec there on the right. Now, I've just very loosely sketched that in, so I'm going to move back to his, the rest of his body here, placing in the shadows around his arm, really trying to accentuate the muscle mass throughout these areas to show visually that he is an extremely big, tough-looking brute of a monster. And, uh, you know, by placing in those shadows and adding that additional contrast, this allows us to break the muscles up and define them even further. Now, we don't want to define them completely. We don't want to re-outline these muscles because that'll just look like a medical drawing, an anatomy diagram. We're not trying to create that here. So we want to break those lines up. And the way in which I approach that process is just as before, I'm thinking about where that major light source is hitting the forms throughout his body. And at the high points of those forms, the points at which the light is hitting those areas at its most intense, I'm breaking the lines so that it is only as the contours that it surround those muscles draw away from the light and transition into shadow that we see them thicken up, that those outlines become more obvious and more visually visible. Now, his overall body is made of a very strong stone-like material. So you can see there that I've started to add in some of the details that might indicate 
the kind of texture that I'm going for as far as his skin is concerned. We see some cracks there around his upper deltoid on the left there um, and around his bicep. And now I'm switching over to his right arm and I'm starting to outline his fist and just making sure that that is looking correct. Again, I'm using sharp but fairly loose line work here, the kind of line work that still gives me the freedom to make adjustments when needed. So I'm not 100% committing to the line work that I'm adding in here just yet. Once I start placing in the line weights, that's when you know that I've decided the contours I've dropped loosely in here are the ones that I'm going to keep. So I kind of work lightly, whether I'm doing this traditionally or digitally, I'm always making sure that I am going from light to dark when I'm ready to define the drawing and take it through to its final stages, that's when I start to go over the top as I'm doing here with a much darker outline because I'm essentially solidifying the drawing then. I'm cementing it in place. So I'm attempting to knock out some of the details here on his headgear. And I'm not quite sure how that's going to look. It is very much an, a process of exploration and experimentation. I really love the design phase of any character concept because, you know, once those foundations are down, I don't have to concern myself with the technicalities of whether or not the anatomy is all placed incorrectly, whether or not the character is in proportion, you know, that's already been figured out. So now I can really unleash my creativity and have some fun with it. So I, I really, really love this stage, just knocking out the details and bringing the end visual together for this character, defining their appearance and, and solidifying it in stone. So I'm adding line weights in as I go here. And what I mean by line weights is I'm simply thickening up the line and making it thinner along its trajectory to give it some visual dynamicness to make it look visually interesting and much, much more appealing. The areas in which I thicken the line up are usually going to be around the forms or the sections of the character that are facing away from the light and transitioning or dropping off completely into shadow. For example, around his eye socket there, you can see that on the edge of his mechanical headpiece, the metal that's wrapping around his eye there, I've thickened up the interior line as it drops off into his eye, into the darker pocket, the darker recess that we've established there. And in the lighter areas of his helmet or his half helmet that I'm structuring around his face here, you can see that I've got very, very light contours. I've thinned that line out. It's not as thick anymore. This is extremely important because what we can do here as we lay in the line work alone is suggest the light source without shadow and without rendering, just through the contours alone, we are able to indicate that this character is being lit. And this is extremely useful for us as comic book artists, because a lot of the time we are going to have situations throughout the comic book sequences that we're constructing where the characters are placed in a very lit environment. And so we're not going to have the opportunity to incorporate, depending on our style and how much 
rendering we would usually add in, how much shadow we would typically incorporate into the illustration, we might not have the opportunity to do so. And it might only be through the lines alone, the major contours that we're able to indicate the lighting setup that we've established for a particular scene around our character. Now, as I go here, I'm adding in some rendering just to describe the material or the metallic assets I'm adding in around his jawline. Now this allows me to describe the shape of the secondary forms that this headgear consists of. And you can see that it is indeed quite complex, but just for me in a design sense, the reason that I'm starting to render it out now is I need to know whether or not the forms that we're dealing with here work again in a functional way. I want to see also whether or not they work in a visual way. So whether or not they look good, whether or not they make sense visually. And I think that they do. You know, I'm trying to, to get a good idea as to how the surface of those pieces of metal would curve and dip. And the rendering allows me to do that. It gives me a visual indication to, as to how exactly that's happening. Now I'm also starting to render out, and I shouldn't be jumping into the rendering stage so soon. I am kind of putting the cart before the horse here, and I shouldn't be doing that because what ends up happening is I'll render one section of the character before I finished outlining the rest and it just ruins the ordering of the process. It, it really does make the entire workflow less predictable. But at least here, what I'm able to do at this point is to somewhat establish a level of density for the rendering that I can replicate throughout the rest of Goliath's body. So it's, it's somewhat of a measuring tool you could think of it as. But I've decided that I've rendered out his head enough. Maybe I've woken up to the fact at this point that I shouldn't have jumped into the rendering so soon. And now I'm taking my attention to his mini guns. Now, I've got a few references up, obviously, because I do not know what a minigun is supposed to look like. I'm not familiar with them. I have obviously never seen one in person. So... I've, uh, I've collected as many references as I could, and even other concept designers' interpretation of how they would look in a sci-fi medium. I've also placed those onto my reference sheet just to give me some ideas there, not to steal those ideas, but to help inspire new ideas for me. I've also realized that the scale of his underwear wasn't quite working in proportion to the rest of his body. So visually, I needed to increase its size. So I completely erased the previous design that I'd come up with for them. And then I had another go at it. Again, it doesn't really matter. Even though the line work that I'd added in had been fairly defined and I could have easily used that and gone over the top of it to lay in the final contours, I decided that, hey, you know what? We need to do some additional work here. We need to revise it. And ultimately, what that led to was a better outcome. And if it leads to a better outcome, it is always worth it. It's never fun having to go back and redo things. But the chances are, when you do, you'll end up with something much more satisfying at the end. And you'll know yourself that you explored and exhausted every last option you had for that character. So now we're going in and we're starting to lay in the final line work for his underwear there. And you can see that I'm really packing on the weight for those lines. I'm thickening them up in the areas where they are running from the underside of a form. 
And also, where they are facing away from the light, I am also laying in a darker, thicker contour for that outline. And in the areas where we see the light hit, or we should see the light hit, the forms at a more intense level, we are going to make the line work much more subtle. So always make sure that you're keeping the primary light source within your scene, the light source that is lighting the character in mind, because that will guide you as to how you should be shaping those contours, how, where the rendering needs to go, where the shadows need to form. That's what I use as my compass. To find that light source right from the beginning, and you, you should be set to go. You won't really have to do a whole lot of guesswork. So now I thought I'd get kind of fancy and use a the shape tool, a combination of the the eclipse tool within Clip Studio Paint and the line tool in order to create a solid template that I could use and go over the top of later on when I laid in the final line work for these mini guns. Now I realize later on that that probably wasn't a good idea because this took a fair while for me to put together anyway. And honestly, at the end of the day, it took away from the natural energy that my line would have had if I simply went in there and knocked it out freehand. But see, the thing is, what I like to make sure I've got for any drawing that I create is a solid structure. And especially for these miniguns, I needed to make sure that they lined up correctly within the perspective that I'd placed them in. And that is very difficult to do when you're dealing with what six a six barreled minigun, all cylinders, and then you've got an, a few other cylinders wrapping around the, that set of six, and you're trying to put them all in perspective. That's a really really tough thing to do. I wish I had kept it looser and simply refined it from that point. But hey, you know what? This template did help to an extent. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I would have approached it differently if I had the opportunity to redo this drawing. <laughs> God forbid. I certainly uh, wouldn't want to have to do that again. But uh, if I had my, if I could rewind back through time and and go through the whole process once more, that's probably how I would approach it. Because you know I don't like to be too medical about the way in which I approach my drawings. A certain energy is evaporated from them, I think, even from that initial drafting stage where you are keeping the lines much looser and you've got that movement behind them. I think that the drawing loses something the more that you refine it, the more that you polish it up. And so the main challenge there is is making sure that you're able to preserve that energy and maintain it as much as possible as you bring that illustration further through to completion. It's not something which is always easy, and it takes a long time for most artists to be able to pull that off. Because when we're just starting out and we're polishing things up, um, it's it's to do with the movement of our hand and and... It's also to do with experience, uh, knowing what's going to work, knowing what to keep and what to take out, knowing what you need to do in order to capture the correct line, the kind of line that appears polished but still preserves that energy, that power that the initial sketch had within it. There's a reason as to why a lot of people really feel drawn to sketch work where they love the look of rough concepts. It's a, it's a visually appealing, and it's extremely attractive on a visual level for some reason. People just love it. You'll run into this problem a lot of the time if you've ever tried to ink your own penciled work. For some reason, the inks just 
they don't look as visually pleasing as the initial pencils did. They're all polished up, they're sharp, they're clean, and even though that's what you're going for, it somehow that is precisely what's taking away from the magic that those pencils had. So, a skilled inker will know how to maintain that magic and incorporate a little bit of their own along the way in order to come up with an inked representation of those initial pencils that really do the drawing justice. So, I'm here still messing around with this minigun template, and uh, it's... Very technical. I'm not really drawing here whatsoever. I'm using the transform tool a lot. I'm copying and I'm pasting a lot of the shapes that I'm laying down onto the page. I'm trying to keep it fast, but as you can see, it is taking an extended length of time for me to get this looking right. But I'm thinking that in the end, hopefully it'll help me out. So it's a gamble. It's a bit of an investment of time that I hope will be a worthy investment of time. And there's just never any guarantees. Maybe it will work out and maybe it won't. Maybe it will be a complete flop. And I'll be kicking myself because of all the time I wasted doing this up. And I kind of was by the end for the reasons that I just explained before. So, you know, you've... You've got to measure this stuff, decide, make the decisions that you need to make, and and use your best judgment, because there's never any guarantees when it comes to comic book illustration. You've just got to make the most of what you've got and hope for the best. You've only got your skill set, and there's just no getting around it. Your skill set is only ever going to be at a certain level, whether you're a pro or or whether you're an amateur just starting out, you have to accept that at the end of the day, there's only so much that you can do, that you're capable of, and there is a certain freedom in that. You can ease up on yourself at that point, take a load off, and just say, hey, you know what, I'm going to do the very best that I can here, and as long as I do that, this drawing is a success, at least in my eyes. Now, you'll learn from it, You'll upgrade your abilities, usually through experience. This is how it's done. The way you get better at drawing is you draw more. And that is what the greatest teacher of all is. Being able to draw as much as possible, being fearless in the face of making mistakes so that you can learn from those mistakes, and then taking on board everything you've learned and applying it to your process so that the next day, when you sit down at the drawing board, you're able to rip out something which is even more awesome than what you created the day before. All right, so we've taken care of one minigun. Now we're, we're taking our attention over to the next minigun. And as you can see, we are looking at a complete visual mess right now. Uh, I'm copying and I'm pasting Again, I've got so many layers that I'm dealing with because of that, because they're all pasting onto other layers, new layers. And then I'm going ahead and I'm erasing bits and pieces that I've added in there to make it less visually confusing to look at, erasing away the guidelines. And I'm really looking forward to getting past this point so that I can start drawing over the top of them and seeing whether or not this plan that I've devised is actually going to execute in the way that I think it's going to execute, whether or not I'm going to get the outcome I'm looking for here. And now I'm going ahead and I'm erasing that initial minigun sketch that I added in there. And I've decided that, you know what, for now I've had enough of working on those mini guns. So I'm going to go back to Goliath and I'm going to start doing some more drawing because at this stage I haven't really drawn for a while. I've been focused on getting the template down for those mini guns, so I just want to get my pencil moving again. Enough of the shape tool, enough of the line tool, time to get back to what I do best. Now hands are usually very, very difficult for me to draw. I'm not going to lie, they're probably, if I struggled with one thing the most, it would be hands. 
And so for some reason, I was very surprised that I didn't struggle more with Goliath's hands. Usually I have to erase and I have to redo them a billion times to get them looking right. And it probably is because he's got exaggerated proportions here in this instance. I have the most trouble with regularly proportioned people. And the reason is, is because I'm very, very conscious of the fact that a normal person is going to look a particular way. And that most people, when they look at that drawing of a normal person, are going to recognize immediately whether or not it's been structured correctly. Whereas with a character like this, which is blown out of proportion, you know, it's, you can, as I was saying before, you can get away with a lot. And I think because it takes the pressure off of you as an artist, when you are drawing these beastly creatures, you can relax a little bit. And because you're relaxing, you do a better job anyway. You tend to sink into that less analytical headspace that you would otherwise be in if you were worried about how you were, your drawing was looking to other people and you start to let your natural artistic intuition take over, which actually has a lot of information stored away within it that it puts right out of the page without you having to even try. And so when I'm in that headspace, all of a sudden drawing hands ain't that much of a big deal. And you can see here that that was very much the case. Now, I still had references up, of course, for his hands. And the reference that I like using most when it comes to drawing hands is my own hands. I like to, if I need to make a fist, I'll just make a fist. And I'll hold it up and I'll try to sketch it down real quick onto the page. It looks a little bit awkward, I'm not going to lie. But, you know, that really does help me out. And... It's a reference that we've all got at our disposal that we can use at any point whenever we need it. So I try to take full advantage of that as much as possible. So I'm going in here and I'm starting to lay in the shadows and the uh, thicker outlines around his fist around those knuckles, really trying to get their forms reading correctly. Remember that the size of the shadows that you add in around those subforms throughout the design of your character will indicate the amount of depth that they're going to have, that that form consists of. So the amount to which those knuckles are raised off of the hands will be visually indicated by the amount of shadow that I'm adding in around them. Now we're going down to the legs. I love drawing legs now. I never used to, but I do now because I've got a fairly solid idea of, of what their muscle structure consists of. And I know what muscles reside within the upper leg. I know what muscles reside within the lower leg. And, uh, you know, it, it helps me out in a big way. It boosts your confidence because... After a while, after a time, as you're laying in the structure of your character and, you know, you've rendered enough muscles, you've rendered and shadowed enough of these, the, the, the anatomy that typically pops up again and again within the characters that you're drawing, what you find is that you get a fairly solid idea as to how much shadow you should be placing around them in order to indicate the depth of the form that, that you want to go for, because all of these muscles have a certain amount of depth to them. And you want to describe not just that depth, but also their shape. You know, you want to really indicate the, the surface and how it curves around those major underlying forms that we initially laid in for the figure. Because this makes the character look much more 3D and visually compelling. This is what makes them pop off the page and it's something which is always useful to have in your arsenal of comic book expertise comic art expertise thick shadows look dramatic but they also help you to describe the three-dimensionality of your characters in a very very compelling way 
Now, toes usually freak me out as well. I'm not very good at drawing toes or feet. Um, but for some reason here, Goliath, I just it just came out onto the page for me. Again, it's probably because I was relaxed, that I wasn't really worried. And it probably just looks good in general because he is a creature. You know, I certainly wouldn't draw the same foot on a female, regularly sized character because it just wouldn't look right. It'd look a little bit scary, to be quite frank with you. This is very much a monster's foot. Even on a male character, this might look a little bit concerning for some. I certainly wouldn't like to wake up one day with a foot like Goliath's. Um, but, you know, as you can see, it's... Uh, in this particular context, the way in which I've illustrated the different parts of Goliath's body, it works really, really well. Now, I want you to observe here as we take the pencil around the outside contours of his leg, how I have accentuated its shape and really tried to define it in an obvious way. This is extremely important because as much as you want to try to get all the muscle groups positioned in just the right areas throughout the body, you also want to make sure that you capture their shape because it is their shape that oftentimes defines the outside bounding contour of the character's silhouette. And you want to emphasize that as much as possible because this is really what the viewer is going to see first. It's the first thing that's going to hit their eyes when they're looking at your artwork is the silhouette of the character. And the shape of a character from a distance is going to be what is most visible anyway. If you really blur your eyes, it's only the, the major shapes that you're going to be able to see. All the details, all the rendering that you add in on top, the subtler outlines, they're going to disappear. And so in order to create a much more impactful level of readability for your illustrations, what you want to make sure is that you're always, always emphasizing the shape, the silhouette of the character as much as possible. And that about wraps up today's demonstration. I hope that you got a ton of value out of it. If you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. Over on the site, you'll find a bunch of tutorials, more videos, a podcast, and when you're ready to take your skill set to the next level, you can also check out our selection of courses. Until next time, keep on creating. Keep on practicing and I'll see you in the next video.